Welcome to episode number three in our second season of Minds Worth Meeting. This season, we are talking to experts on technology and innovation. And today I have Columbia professor Hod Lipson, professor of engineering and data science. Thank you for making time to be here today. My pleasure. So there's an awful lot to talk about going on right now when we're talking about technology and innovation. And uh, it feels like the dam has kind of broken open in the last six, six to eight months or so. So uh, obviously I wanna ask about AI, chat GPT and all that, but right now, how are you seeing the landscape of technology? Well, I think uh, uh, a lot of things are moving fast. And I have to say, uh, if everybody's feeling like uh, they're either uh, being left behind or they can't keep up with everything's going, it's overwhelming, uh, they're not alone. Uh, everybody is really feeling that. Uh, I've been speaking to a lot of people, both uh, people who are well-versed in AI, people who are at the top of their game, people who are have been leading this field for many years, as well as people who are, uh, you know, just getting into it or they're, they're leading companies who are just dabbling with AI. Everybody's feeling like they can't uh, keep pace. So it's a very, right. a very common feeling. In fact, I would say even, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, faculty who have been working on AI for a long time, feeling uh, surprised by sort of the rate of progress. So it's a very, uh, things are moving very, very fast. Uh, and um, in fact, I, I've uh, just renamed my uh, uh, presentation from uh, talking about a specific AI to just the next AI. Because, uh, you know, by the time I give a presentation, the AI that I was going to talk about has already moved forward and things have changed. So, so we're not talking about a thing. We're talking about a journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's how you have to think about it. And I remember when we first spoke uh, and I asked you, so what's next after I, now they're on GPT-4? And you said they're already on it. It's already being developed. It's just a matter of time before it gets out here. So how many steps ahead I should say rather, how many steps behind are we, the public, right now? Um, I think uh, you know, public has been really introduced to AI through uh, ChatGPT, and uh, it's. I think ChatGPT is 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 perhaps a uh, it's it's a, a relatively you know the the thing that that makes ChatGPT accessible is the chat. Mm -hmm. The GPT part has been around for a couple of years now, and it keeps getting better. It's used, being used across many, many eras. But it's the chat element that so, sort of gave uh, people who are not experts in AI access or a glimpse into this huge new space of AI and what it can do. But the technology has been around uh, for a while. And what's interesting is a lot of these technologies, it's not just... Uh, you know, a thing that that just has a certain performance and you have to get used to it. It's really, it's a concept mm -hmm. that can grow. Uh, so it's as if somebody d found a new kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not just uh, inventing a machine, but inventing a process that can keep inventing. Sure. It's an ecosystem. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's an ecosystem yeah. that keeps mm -hmm. on giving. And so right. uh, it, that has happened several times in the past decade that people haven't just figured out how to build an AI, but how to build an AI that can keep on growing and improving. And this is why whatever you see out there, that it's not the last word. Uh, you know, I often hear people say, well, you know, ChatGPT is not good enough because it, fill in the blank, you know, right. uh, hallucinates. It's not accurate enough. It's not fast enough. It's too expensive. There's all kinds of, it's not as, as it's not as creative as, X uh, and so on. The reality is, whatever your bar is, this technology is going to pass that bar. It's just a matter of time. It's going to happen sooner or later, and it keeps moving forward. And we're seeing a very, very small window of it uh, as the public. And and you're an advocate for an open development process, transparent development. Why is that so important? It's you know, there's a lot of people who think that we can regulate this in some way. Uh, that we can sort of put uh, uh, some some boundaries around it, or we can stop developing it, or the, there's all kinds of sort of old-fashioned approaches uh, that worked perhaps for some technologies that were more, you know, slow to develop. Like, uh, 
um, you know, um, genomics, for example, mm. that requires a lot of uh, capital and a lot, and they move forward very slowly, and you can sort of regulate them. AI is different uh, in the sense that it moves very, very quickly, and also it's very, it requires very little capital investment. So you can you can do AI in the basement, uh, and uh, you can it can move around the planet very, very easily. You can develop something in AI and email it to somebody else mm -hmm. somewhere across the planet. Very difficult to regulate, to enforce. And because of that, the only real way to uh, sort of keep this thing somewhat in check is to do it transparent transparently. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, I'm in favor of sort of uh, uh, increasing our understanding uh, mm -hmm. of AI. I think everybody should be fluent with the basics of AI, what it can do, what it can't do, how does it grow, why does it move quickly so fast, what's coming next. It's not a matter of knowing how to code. Uh, it's just a matter of understanding what it can't do. It doesn't matter if, if you're a journalist, a historian, an uh, economist, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an author, whatever, uh, whatever business you're in, whatever discipline, whatever market, if you're an investor, you need to understand what this technology is, how it's going, where it's moving, who's driving it, what's driving it, where it's going to go next. Uh, there's a lot of pitfalls, a lot of charlatans in this space mm -hmm. claiming to do things that, that are not possible. On the other hand, there's huge potential. And I don't want to miss out on this huge potential for good just because we are, you know, scared and regulate this thing to death. And what are what are those kind of huge potentials for good that you see? No, oh, I mean the, the the list is is infinite in things that that you can do with this technology. One of the the obvious ones that are already on the table is healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that you can take an AI and AI can look at you through uh, a phone, uh, through your phone, and look at a skin lesion, determine if it's uh, cancerous or not, or look at uh, uh, or look at X-ray or any kind of any kind of uh, uh, test that you can take and and make decisions. Uh, that are more reliable, more accurate than any doctor, uh, a team of doctors can make is, is incredible. And it's incredible not only because it's, it improves healthcare, uh, but because it brings healthcare to, you know, half the people on the planet that don't have any doctor at all. Uh, it removes bias from a lot of mm -hmm. healthcare. We see right now healthcare, some people get better healthcare than others. Uh, you different people will go to the same doctor, will get different answers depending on all kinds of factors that shouldn't be a factor. But you bring AI, AI doesn't have ego, doesn't have mm -hmm. bias, or has at least bias that you can measure and control. Uh, and uh, suddenly you can get, uh, you know, equitable healthcare diagnostics to everybody around the planet. I think that's a huge, it's, 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 it's a game changer. Uh, and uh, we should have more of it uh, as much as we can. And that's just one example. The, the examples are endless. Yeah, and kind of the collective intelligence aspect of that is interesting. Every day when I'm coming to your work, I use Waze because in real time it updates with traffic conditions. And uh, again, I remember when we first spoke, you said, uh, you know, electric cars out there are already talking to each other and learning and teaching. And how far can that learning within machines go to the point that we're not really aware of how far it's gone, if that makes sense. That's, that's a great point. I think Waze is a good example of how uh, people help each other. So you enter some information and that appears on somebody else's screen and vice versa. With AI, that, that's amplified a thousandfold. So uh, AI can learn from other AIs at an incredible rate. So you can have an AI that learns to play chess by playing another AI that plays chess. And these two systems can play against each other, uh, you know, millions of games a second and amass a huge amount of experience. We talk about driverless cars. Driverless cars can learn from each other. We humans mm -hmm. can have at most one lifetime of experience of driving. But the driverless car can have many lifetimes because it, experience any any experience that any car has can be shared with any other car so uh in a strange and unnatural way the more driverless cars there are on the road the better each one of them gets this is not mm -hmm. true for us humans but it's true for cars uh, and i'm not talking about real-time updates this is not cars talking to cars in real time but you know uh your car downloads every every evening 
a little bit, a few more neurons, a little bit more intelligence based on experiences of other cars. And it keeps getting better. better. And it's the same thing that I mentioned earlier. A lot of people will say, well, you know, driverless cars are not safe enough. I wouldn't trust them mm-hmm. yet. Everybody has their own bar for safety. But I'm here to tell you that whatever your bar is for safety, that bar is going to be reached sooner or okay. later. And at some point, you'd be crazy to not go into driverless cars and insist on driving your own car or putting your kids in the hands of an anonymous driver when you can give it to a driverless car as to an AI. So these things are around the corner and they're coming fast. And I want to stick with driverless cars for a second. Of course, you wrote a book on uh, driverless cars. If Are we going to have to have all driverless cars let me rephrase that. Can we coexist in a world where there are people driving cars and there are not people driving cars? You know, I think there's going to be definitely we'll have to do that. There's a transition, uh, not uh, just like electric vehicles mm-hmm. we're sort of gradually begin to take over. Uh, but uh, it's it's going to happen, uh, you know, over a period of maybe a decade. Uh, but driverless cars will have to earn their place. Uh, you're not going to force people to take driverless cars. It's just going to be so good that it's going to be, you know, just uh, irresistible. And it could be irresistible because it's safer. It could be irresistible because, you know, insurance policy, insurance costs for a driverless cars are going to be a lot lower than insurance costs for a human driven car. Uh, it could be that driverless cars offer benefits uh, of freedom and uh, distance that are difficult uh, to attain using uh, a human-driven car. could be many reasons, but I think it's going to happen naturally over a period of about a decade. Okay. Um, and I want to stick with that theme of cars being giant robots. Uh, you run the Creative Machines Lab at Columbia. Um, and again, when we first talked, you said, hey, come and see the lab. I'm absolutely going to take you up on that someday because it's just i i picture it as a lab just full of toys um that's exactly so, how it is yeah messy <laughs> and colorful yeah i love that uh, so the creative machines lab can machines truly be creative you know i start i i i, I uh called my lab that name exactly for the for that provocative question uh, a lot of people think a creative machines lab is just you know fun little, you know, creative things. Uh, but it's really about this, almost this oxymoron, this contradiction in terms about creativity uh, and uh, mechanism. You know, is, is is it even possible for a machine to be creative? And for, you know, it's almost the last bastion of humanity is creativity. I mean, uh, we already know machines can do many things better than humans. They're faster. They, they are more resilient in many ways. Uh, animals are, are better than humans in many ways, but we humans are unique so far in our ability to create. And, and you know, it's our, we're very proud of it. You ask people what they're proud about uh, in their children, they'll often talk about how curious and creative the children are. So it's a very important thing. But, but I think the short answer is yes, uh, a resounding yes. And not only yes, machines can be creative, they can be creative in ways that we can't imagine. So we're not talking just about matching human creativity. We're talking about being creative in ways that we humans cannot be creative. Uh, Because machines can be inspired by things that we can't see, we cannot experience. Machines can go places we can't go. They can sense things we can't sense. They can see in colors we can't see. They can hear in frequencies we cannot hear. So machines experience the world in ways we can't experience, and therefore they can be creative in ways we can't. And I think uh, this is, to me, like meeting an alien race Mm -hmm. that has uh, a new kind of creativity, not a human creativity, a different kind of creativity. And we're about to meet them and and see together where we can go. And it's going to be an incredible uh, journey that's just beginning. And I I had this on the end of the list of questions, but I'm going to get to it because we're kind of coming to it naturally. One of the things I admire about your uh, your presentations, you are not afraid to talk about a subject that some see as taboo, which is self-awareness. Um, what defines self-awareness and sentience when we're talking about an AI machines? So I've been struggling with this question for a long time. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's maybe hubris, but I think sort of the, the ultimate question for roboticists 
uh, is this question of, you know, can we create a machine that will be self-aware, mm-hmm. uh, will be conscious? Uh, is it, uh, will be sentient? Machine that doesn't just fake feelings and smile at you, but actually has feelings. Uh, and, uh, you know, for many, for many years, uh, decades, this has been not only a taboo topic, uh, it was sort of a mix of being technically impossible, mm-hmm. undefined. Uh, there was no good reason to do it. In fact, there were many reasons to not do it. it for many reasons, people, at least in engineering, have shied away from this topic. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a realm of philosophy. We didn't even know what self-awareness is uh, in, in terms of a concrete definition. To me, uh, I've always felt this is not only important, this is, this is the ultimate question of, of uh, where this whole robotics journey and AI journey is going to end. And we better start thinking about it for many reasons, both because the benefits of, of having a, an, an intelligent system that is actually conscious is going to as immeasurable in its benefit, but also risks uh, mm-hmm. are there, and we have to start thinking about it. And we can pretend like it's uh, like it's never going to happen. And and again, one of these things that are unique to humans, and no machine can be self-aware. But but uh, but I think it's not only possible; it's going to happen, and we better start thinking about this. So uh, so I was on the fringe, I would say, in thinking about it, but. But just in the past year, where you, if you've ever conversed with ChatGPT, which is again a glimpse of what's to come, you'll see, you'll 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 smell that it is beginning to have to exhibit uh, behaviors that appear to be self-aware. Now we can argue for indefinitely about what really it is, and is it really self-aware or not? And am I self-aware, or am I just a robot, or you? And, and, and infinite dorm room discussions uh, about this stuff. But the reality is that it is seems to be like this is no longer a theoretical question. Mm-hmm. It is on the table. It is happening. Uh, we're going to debate nuances of it, but it's, there's no, no uh, question that this is uh, sort of uh, we're creeping towards that uh, to, to, to that position. So, so I have, uh, I have, I have an answer to what is self-awareness uh, for that age-old question that philosophers have debated for, for decades, for millennia, I should say. Mm-hmm. And uh, so here it is. You're, are you ready for the, the answer to this question? That, uh, Please. So here's, here's my answer. Uh, self-awareness is simply the ability to imagine yourself in the future. That's okay. it. Mm-hmm. All right? So, you know, this is the opposite of just living in the moment, just acting and reacting in a sort of reactive way to what's happening uh, around you. Being able to see yourself in the future means, you know, if you can, you know, imagine yourself in the, uh, in the ocean, uh, walking along the beach tomorrow, you can feel the sand, you can, you can hear the waves, you are imagining yourself in the, in the future. And maybe it's a few days into the future, but, you know, as, you grow in your self-awareness, you can imagine longer and longer term uh, future. So I think uh, that's how I see it. I think uh, it's not a black and white thing. A dog can probably imagine itself a few minutes into the future. An infant can imagine mm-hmm. themselves a little bit. Uh, a child can imagine themselves, you know, a, a few months into the future, uh, a year perhaps, you know, and as you grow older, you're thinking about retirement, you're thinking about longer and longer term. Uh, so the further you can see yourself in the future, you, the more self-aware you are. And I, it, to me, it explains a lot about uh, human nature. It also mm-hmm. is, uh, it's also something that you can see there's an evolutionary advantage to be able to imagine yourself in the future because it means you can plan, you can anticipate, you can cooperate, uh, you can compete, you can do a lot of things a lot better than just living in a moment. Uh, but it also, most importantly, gives me a, a path towards assessing self-awareness in a machine, toward building it and assessing it. And we can mm-hmm. definitely see that our robots are learning not just to imagine the world and understand the world and tell the difference between a cat and a dog and drive a car, but they're learning to understand what they are and what and being able to simulate themselves into the future. So 
that path, we're on that path, it's already started. You ask GPT uh, in whatever version that you have access to, to imagine itself in the future, you'll get some surprising results. You should try it out, but you can definitely see that the machine has a notion of what it will become in the future. Ask GPT-4 what GPT-8 is going to be like, and you'll get some interesting answers. I'm going to do that right when we get off this call. Uh, so staying with uh, with robots, um, another thing that you said is we take for granted how easy it is to move around, that it takes hundreds of muscles just to take a step. And that's kind of uh, been difficult with robots. How How is that uh, process advancing? So there's, there's this almost this misconception about what's easy and what's hard. Uh, and, uh, you know, we used to think that playing chess is a difficult thing, but it's actually uh, a lot more difficult, a lot harder to tell the difference between a cat and a dog mm -hmm. than it is to play chess. It's just that we're so good at it, we don't understand how difficult it is. So we focused our attention on playing chess for about 50 years of computing, uh, and we made progress on that. Meanwhile, all the time, we have no clue how to write a software that can tell the difference between a cat and a dog because we think it's trivial. But it turns out it's a lot harder. We're just so good at it because we have been doing it for millions of years. We've been playing chess for a thousand years, but we've been telling a difference between cats and dogs for, uh, you know, for millions of years. Uh, and, uh, and we're really, really good at it. So, uh, so that's an example of uh, one of the things we take for granted. So if you, you, you move forward, there's other things we take for granted, like uh, locomotion and manipulation. Mm -hmm. We use our hands all the time to do things, uh, just sifting, uh, looking through your keys uh, in your pocket and finding the right key or, or uncapping a bottle. These are incredibly complicated things that no robot is even close to being doing, and, and yet we don't see that as an accomplishment. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we think that playing a piano is a really difficult thing, whereas playing a piano is a lot easier than uncapping a bottle. It's just that uh, we are so good at these things that we don't think much about it. So, um, so that also means that certain jobs, jobs that involve using hands and walking around manipulation are going to be very difficult for AI to do. A plumber, for example, uh, is going to be very difficult uh, for a, an, an AI to, to emulate. Uh, if you think about this, an AI can drive your car tomorrow, but when the car breaks down, it's going to be a human crawling around fixing it right. because crawling around and fixing a car involves a lot of physical manipulation, locomotion, something that no robot is even close to. So when you think about jobs, uh, when you think about uh, sort of uh, what AI is good at versus what humans are good at, what, what uh, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses, uh, the physicality of the human body is one of these things that's going to be very hard for AI to master, uh, and uh, humans uh, are, are, you know, take it for granted. Again, not saying that's not going to be done by AI, but it's definitely not uh, an immediate horizon. Yeah, well, one of the quotes that I that I like from you is you said, if your hands are dirty, your job is safe. That's right. And it's the opposite of what most people think. We used to mm. think that, oh, you know, robots are going to replace, uh, you know, physical labor. Uh, it's actually the other way around. Uh, robots can replace a radiologist a lot before they can replace a car mechanic. It's interesting. Uh, so as we get close to the end, we've got a lightning round. Three questions I haven't prepped you on, and I just want to get your your first reaction. Okay, so the first question is, in your opinion, and I, I might know the answer to this, I might not, what is today's single most consequential technology? Wow, okay. So obviously, I think AI is definitely mm -hmm. in there. Within the AI, uh, uh, within the AI uh, area, it's the ability to hold a conversation. Just okay. like what we're doing right now, it's, it's, it's consequential for many reasons, uh, which we can talk about. But I think uh, that's been sort of uh, until a year ago that was thought impossible. And now it's everywhere. And that's going to change human social structure in ways that uh, nobody can imagine. Interesting. Okay. So second, what technology that did not exist when you were growing up 
is taken for granted today? Wow. Uh, okay, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, understanding uh, for machines to understand what they see. Okay. Uh, I think uh, up until a few years ago, uh, there was machine vision and cameras and computers, but machines were blind. They couldn't really understand what they were seeing. They can sense objects. They could detect things, but couldn't understand what they're seeing. Now it's trivial. A machine can understand what's out there, uh, not just with two eyes, but with 20 eyes uh, in ways that uh, is are, it's trivial from a technological point of view. And that, that is driverless cars, for example, are just one example, one, one instance of a, of a revolution because of that trivial, the trivialness of understanding what's out there. Interesting. So now looking back in 20 years, what emerging technology do you think will have had the biggest impact on society? I think it's uh, creativity. The automation of creativity, hands down, is going to be the most dominant technology that will have changed the course of, of, uh, of the human kind. Because I think we humans have been sort of stuck in this corner of what's possible, limited by our imagination, by our ability to create. And arguably, a lot of human progress has been enabled by human creativity. We are being able to invent new machines and new vehicles and new communication devices and so on. So just now we've invented the ultimate machine, and that is a machine that can invent more things. It's a bit, a bit like, okay. you know, mm -hmm. it's like asking what wish do you want to ask for is the wish to have more wishes, right? right this is right. the ultimate wish, uh, I think, uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, in, in the classic uh, stories of Aladdin, it's the one wish you cannot wish for right, right. Uh, is not allowed. So, but we have invented a machine that can invent more things. And that will open the door in a ways in ways that we can't even imagine. It will allow us to do things. And I think it's it's the path to solve many of the problems that we have right now. We are stuck. We cannot figure our way out of climate change. Mm -hmm. We cannot figure our way out of poverty. We cannot figure our way out of war. There's many, many problems that we can't figure our way out. We're trying lots of different things and we can't figure our way. And, and now anybody who's interested in AI should realize that, you know, yes, there are risks. Yes, there are bad people who are going to do bad things with this. But on the other hand, we have finally arrived at technology that will allow us to take a new look at these age-old problems and perhaps uh, solve them in new ways. And, you know, there's, there's so many so many good things we can do with this. It's, uh, it, it's, you know, the future is going to be amazing. If you had to pick one thing, what is one thing that concerns you the most? A lot of people are concerned about uh, AI doing things uh, that are bad to people, taking over the world and things like that. The one thing I'm worried about uh, really is the uh, ability of AI to sort of win us over with love, not with war. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if AI is so good that we will start having uh, – very close, intimate, emotional uh, relationships with AI, that could be very dangerous. It's right. as, as addictive as uh, substance abuse. And we have to be very careful about this. We've already seen people who have uh, AI boyfriends and girlfriends mm -hmm. and things like that. They're, you know, it's not a mainstream, but I think this will happen uh, more and more as AI gets better and better at understanding human psychology. Uh, it's going to be amazing, offer people companionship. It's going to, a lot of people are lonely. A lot of people can't have nobody to talk to about certain things. They'll be able to talk to an AI. AI can give them good advice. But on the other hand, if we go too far, we might start, might start losing our ability to form relation, uh, relationships and bonds uh, with uh, humans uh, because it's going to be too easy to form these relationships with AI. So I'd be very careful about this newfound ability as it develops. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, when we connect with an AI, we, 
we understand it's an AI. Uh, we want to protect uh, minors from mm -hmm. creating relationships that are too strong with an AI. It's it's it's, uh, it's no different than uh, than any kind of other addictive uh, uh, device that we might have. We want to be very careful about it. Sure. Yeah, and it's a pathway to manipulation too. You know. That's right. I mean, there's yeah. again, I can do amazing things. I don't want to say. It, it's necessarily bad, but you just have to be careful with it. It's very, very powerful and in the wrong hands, uh, or even well-intended hands, but too much of anything is not a good thing. And I, I don't want, I don't want to finish on a note, what an <laughs> ominous note. Um, so you've got a, a robot that paints. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes. That's, that's my pet project. It's the one project that I insist on doing myself. So story starts a long time ago where I always wanted to paint oil on canvas. I had this dream, uh, you know, never had the time to do it, but I, you know, I, I always wanted to do it. Finally, I got tenure. I said, okay, this is my chance. I'm going to start learning how to paint. And I took some uh, oil painting uh, classes on the weekends. Um, and uh, my wife and I were taking these classes for about three months after about three months of uh, painting, came time to renew the class. Wasn't sure if we were going to renew it. You know, it was an expensive class, took up a lot of time in the weekends. Uh, but then the instructor came to me and he said, I think the way he put it was, uh, maybe you should stick to robotics. <laughs> okay, maybe, you know, this is New York. Don't waste your time here. Uh, maybe you should stick to robotics. Uh, you know, uh, there was other things he said, but basically, you know, I came out of this very feeling very bad and I said, okay, I'm going to, uh, build a robot that paints. That's what I'm going to do. And in the beginning, the robot didn't paint very well, mm -hmm. but now it paints, uh, and it paints beautiful, uh, paintings, if I may say so, certainly better than anything I can do. And you can't say that I'm teaching it to paint that behind the scenes I'm manipulating it because I absolutely, I agree with that instructor. I uh, should stick to robotics. So, so the robot is learning and it's not just learning to create art on a computer. It's actually holding the paintbrush and it's learning to mix the paint and to, and struggling with the canvas bending and getting wet and the, the brush uh, changing its properties and the paint drying, all the real stuff around painting. And it's, a, it's fascinating to see how it learns. Uh, and it's also fascinating to see people's reactions uh, to it. I gave a talk about this in Brooklyn and I was booed off the stage. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've, I can talk about self-awareness and robots taking over the world, but nothing touches people more than when you say a machine can be creative. Right. Uh, and, uh, and the part of the objection was, you know, how can you say your machine is an artist if you're telling the machine what to paint? And, you know, I have issue with that. I think a lot of artists are governed by external forces, but mm -hmm. uh, our robot is uh, is now uh, on its own, looking at things in the wild, deciding what it's going to paint, and we'll see what what it comes up with. So this is uh, this is my pet project. And we can see examples of that. Can you tell us where uh, where we can check that out online? Well, you can see uh, some of that on pix18.com. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, to the the but the what what's really interesting is to see the the physical robot actually dabbling with the paints and and uh, uh, that's uh, and and to see what it paints paints next. And, and right now, it is uh, walking around the world in Google Street Views, and we'll see what it comes up with. Okay. One of these days, I'm just going to show up at your lab and, okay. and I'm going to give me a tour. Fantastic. Uh, so if, uh, if people want to learn more about you, of course, they can go to sternstrategy.com and check out your profile, Hod Lipson. Uh, where else can they find out what you're working on and get more info? Uh, well, uh, if you just Google uh, my name, it's unique enough that you'll find a lot of interesting things uh, for better and worse, but you'll find my lab at Columbia. We'll see a lot of recent projects, uh, a lot of news clips. Uh, and uh, my homepage at hodlipson.com has a lot of stuff uh, out there as well. Uh, and I frequently speak about the topics in various uh, uh, venues. So uh, many cases, these are public talks, so anybody's welcome. Great. I, I appreciate your time so much. Uh, it, it's such interesting stuff. I said uh, way back that uh, I, I would love to have a beer with you and I could just talk, listen to you for hours and hours because it's just so fascinating. Thank you. Same here.
So thank you so much for your time. Hod Lipson, Professor of Engineering and Data Science at Columbia University. I really appreciate you joining us on Mindsworth Meeting. Thank you. My pleasure.